I am here today with Eva Marie Everson, and I'm so excited about her new book that has just launched with New Hope Publishers, and it's called The Ornament Keeper, but it's about so much more than Christmas. So I can't wait to get into some discussion on this wonderful novella that's perfect for any time of year. Hi, Eva. It's just wonderful to have you as my guest today, Thank and I'm you. looking forward to discussing the themes of your book. Thank I'm you bit about how you came to the idea of the ornament keeper. It, it actually began as an idea for another book several years ago that didn't pan out. Um, I, you know, sometimes I think that, especially, you know, the writers who we know, think that because I've had nearly 40 books in print, that if I just spout out an idea, it's automatically accepted. And, and it wasn't. It was, it was, a, it was a great idea, um, but it just, you know, it wasn't the right time for it. And uh, about a year and a half ago, maybe, I'm not really sure when, but um, New Hope contacted me and said that they would like to relaunch their fiction line and they would like to start with a Christmas novella and would I be willing to write it? And did I have any ideas? Mm -hmm. And so I, I, you know, pondered a few things. I actually, I have a file called Book Ideas and these are basically the ideas that either I never, you know, never completed or I sent them out and they were not accepted. So I kind of dusted the old one off and it replaced ornaments with what I had had previously and wrote it out and they liked it. And then they said, well, do you have like an extended version? And I, okay. And so I gave them the extended version and then it, we were, we were good to go after that. And this is not your typical light, fluffy, tied up in a bow romance story. This oh, no. <laughs> is like realistic yeah. struggle in relationships, struggles in marriage, yeah. struggles with yourself and getting mm -hmm. over your own ideas of who you are and your own expectations. Uh, there's yeah. a lot of really deep themes that are heartwarming in the end, but you struggle together with the characters. What are some things that people might see that would reflect reality in their own lives with regard to expectations? Well, you know, I, I'm glad that you said that, that this is not your typical, this is not a hallmark, a boy meets girl, girl falls in love with boy, somebody bakes a cookie, snow falls, and then there's a kiss. It's, it's not that typical kind of uh, romance, uh, holiday romance novel. One of my favorite authors, and he began as a Christmas novella book writer is Richard Paul Evans. I, I love Richard Paul Evans for a couple of reasons. Number one, he's a fantastic writer. And number two, his last name is Evans and mine is Everson. And so my books are often right next to his on the bookshelves in the bookstore, oh. which I can only imagine <laughs> maybe helps my book sales. So um, I really, but I really do love his book and a, a Christmas box it was called. And, and of course now he's got a, about a gazillion books out there. But the one thing about the Christmas box is that it is not, again, it's not the boy meets girl, girl falls in love with boy kind of thing. It's, it's about a struggle that's happening within a family and um, how the father is missing Christmas. I mean, he's missing the whole point of Christmas because he's so consumed with his work. Well, the ornament keeper is much in the same way. Now, there, there, is a, there is a father who is consumed with his work, but that's not what the book is about. It's about a marriage that has fallen apart after 20 years. And if you looked back over the marriage, you would think that there was nothing wrong with it. Everything was good. But there was a root of bitterness that was deep down inside of Felicia, who is the main character, the main female character, um, that she was completely unaware of. But uh, just like all little seeds that are laying in the ground, if something comes along to water that seed, it, it will sprout out of the ground. You know, it could be a beautiful flower if it's not the root of bitterness, if it's the root of love or peace or joy or any of those things. But when it is the root of bitterness and unforgiveness, then it, it feels like kudzu. It grows and it grows and it grows and it takes over. And pretty soon their marriage cannot withstand the, the choking out of this weed that has come into the garden of their marriage. And so as the book opens, it's the Christmas season. And it's the first time the family, um, Felicia, her husband, Jackson, and their children, Sarah and Travis and Hank, will, will spend it not as a family together, but as a broken family. It's going to look back over 
uh, the years that they were together through the ornaments that Jackson gave her as a Christmas gift every year from the first that they married on December the 23rd and they were just you know broke kids and so he just gave her this cute little ornament in the in the toe of her stocking every year after that he would he would repeat that action so as she's hanging those ornaments on the tree she is remembering the the good moments of their marriage as well as the more trying moments and and it's beginning to unveil for her what went wrong mm -hmm. I love that you describe her as not aware of her oh, own no. issues. And that's so true for many of us. We don't realize the things that we need to dig deep and uncover and pull out of ourselves to make mm -hmm. ourselves better people. It's about yeah. work. It's about work inside of ourselves as well as work on our relationships. Because this book, like you said, is not that Hallmark movie where everything goes yeah, smoothly. No. <laughs> fate draws you together she and her estranged husband have to work hard mm -hmm. on their love mm -hmm. relationship and and love is shown as something that's worthy of our work not yes. just something that happens and falls together i yes. love that about the yeah. ornament keeper it's a beautiful and meaningful piece of literature it's mm -hmm. not even though it's small it's a novella yeah. it's yes. still a worthy and lovely work and it's worth everyone's read so Thank tell you. me a little bit about the forgiveness themes in the ornament keeper because those are so important well like you said um felicia is not aware that that she is so angry she is not aware of what's causing her to feel the way she feels uh, about her husband and a particular individual the woman's name is monica craig and they all went to school together she's known monica since they were children but monica went away to, to los angeles to live right after high school and has never been back and yet in some strange way monica has been uh, another member of their marriage without her even you know conceptualizing that and i have gotten some email and uh, i've you know read some of the reviews uh, everybody really really loves the book but they get frustrated with felicia oh my gosh i get so aggravated with her but i think they get frustrated with her because it reveals to them some things about themselves we all hold on to things we shouldn't but we do and sometimes these are things that there's no logical reason behind it so we'll say, well, I don't know why I feel that way about it, but I just do. And we don't look into the why. If Felicia had looked into the why a lot sooner than she did, then the destruction to her marriage would, would never have happened and she would have had a stronger marriage all along. Now, I will say, this is a Christmas novella, so of course it does have a happy ending. I couldn't, I couldn't leave it with them apart, but they did have to go through a lot. There is that digging digging in, digging deeper. One of the things that is said to Felicia by a good friend of hers, who also happens to be uh, her boss at work, uh, is, have you ever read um, the Lord's Prayer? What is the last thing Jesus said in the Lord's Prayer? And uh, Felicia very, you know, laughingly says, amen. So mm -hmm. she says, no, go back and read it again. And of course, it's about forgiveness. Um, Jesus was con concluding the Lord's Prayer with his disciples by saying, to, uh, forgive us our trespasses, we forgive those who trespass against us. Um, and, you know, and then it goes into that, lead us not into temptation, which I think is very interesting. But we kind of think, because we've repeated it so many times in church over and over and over, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever, ever. And we tacked on that, amen. But what Jesus says right after that is that, the same measure that we forgive others, the Father in heaven will forgive us. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's interesting that in the middle of, you know, forgive us and forgive others is lead us not into temptation. Mm -hmm. I think that's very interesting. Um, but we forget that. And so her, her business associate, her boss, her good friend says, you need to go back and read. And, and it takes her a while to do that because life gets in the way and she forgets about it. She forgets about it. And then eventually she picks it up and she reads it. And she realizes that just like so many of us, we want God to forgive us unconditionally. Don't hold on to anything. Don't remember anything stupid that we've done, any deliberate sin, any non-deliberate sin. But we don't want to extend that same grace to someone else because we would prefer to lick our own wounds. Mm -hmm. and to um, to nurse that anger 
and that's that's only going to make it worse. It's it's not where they say unforgiveness is the poison you pour for someone else and then drink yourself. Absolutely. I love that. And that's such a true thing. And mm -hmm. Felicia is also very insecure. And that dates way back before her relationship with her estranged husband. And so she yes. is, she's dealing with this insecurity at the same time, denying the insecurity yes. and trying yeah, to, and it, yeah, it has to do with, you know, that, that thing that women do a lot of times is comparing ourselves to others. Mm -hmm. So always thinking that Monica Craig is the beautiful one. And that's what I was going to say earlier was she always refers to her as Monica Craig, Monica Craig. Craig. And, and Jackson says to her, why do you do that? Why do you always refer to her by her full name? And, and she doesn't realize she's doing it. She says, I don't do that. And he goes, yeah, you do. And she comes to realize that, yes, yeah, she does. But it, it has to do with that disdain. But why is it there? Well, it, you know, in some respects, it's, it's, it's deserved because, you know, uh, Monica was a little bit of a poo-poo head, you know, <laughs> so she was very she was nice. <laughs> girls, she was one of those mean yes. girls in, in yeah. many respects, yeah. Um, uh, she flaunted in front of, of Felicia, and um, there was always that, you know, am I pretty enough? Am I good enough? Am I this? Am I that? And then when Monica went away, it was kind of like, okay, now I don't have to worry about that, and yet she was still holding on to it. Mm -hmm. She was still holding on to what she believed about Jackson and Monica. Yeah. And Monica Craig actually represented to Felicia her own lack, the mm -hmm. things that she doubted about herself. And that's mm -hmm. why she hated her so much and why yeah. she couldn't forgive herself or her husband for something that, you know. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Yeah, exactly. I was at a book club last night and they were asking me about, you know, the ending and how it ended and how I made this decision. And there, and I, I don't want to give it away because I want, you know, your readers to, to read the book, obviously. But I did have to sit down and go back over everything, almost from a psychological standpoint, to decide whether or not what Felicia believed to be true had actually happened. I, I had to lay those two things out, like, okay, if it did happen, then this, and if it didn't happen, then that. And then made the decision to which way to go with that. And I, I think I made the right decision <laughs> because I, I think it made Jackson an even deeper human being. Mm -hmm. And um, and it explained a lot of things. So, you know, we writers, sometimes as we're, we think we know where it's going and then we get to toward the end and we realize we know it's, it's starting to shift and change. and We have to make decisions too. Yeah, so. sometimes the characters decide where the story goes instead they of do. us. Yeah, I, I'm so glad you're also a writer because you understand that, you know, the, the conversation is going on in our ears as we're typing. So, you know, we, we hear the dialogue that's going on and, and every so often, I mean, I have an idea, I know where this is going. And then every so often, one of my characters throws in a line and I go, no, wait a minute, <laughs> that was not in the script. And so, um, and so that's those moments where we stop and we think, well, that might be a better line. So, you know, we have to, to make a decision as to whether or not we're going to go in that direction. And nine times out of 10, I do. I go with my characters. Yes. Sometimes I have a real I back have that psychological depth, but you've also woven it into the beautiful scenery and the mm. background of this lovely Southern rich culture that you've yeah. Yeah. here. And you're so good at that. That oh, would thank to be you. fun to be able to, to couch such profound depth in that culture of beautiful, deep, historic meaning. Yes. I loved writing about their home, all of them, from mm -hmm. the studio to the little craftsman to the big Victorian. And there is that. This is another theme that you will watch them go from, you know, literally, we can't even afford to, to have a Christmas tree. Mm -hmm. We can't afford anything this year. Everything that's in the apartment, with the exception of their bed, is from Goodwill. <laughs> And the reason the bed isn't because they, they robbed their piggy bank. Jackson is very tall. He's like 6'6". Six, six. He's very tall, big guy. They, they have to have a, you know, a certain kind of bed for, for Jackson. But it's just the mattress and box springs. That's all they can afford. And then as life gets better, they move up to a little craftsman. They're happy there, and this is good. But life gets really good. And then they move up to this, this sprawling Victorian home. But on the outside, everything looks like, you know, hey, it's getting better, it's getting better, we're growing in number, we've had our little girl Sarah, now we have a son named Travis, now we, you know, seven years later, we have a son named Hank, surprise, and, and yet, 
there is a fissure in the foundation that they don't even know is there and it's about to start rocking and it doesn't matter how it looks on the outside on the inside it's, it's falling apart yeah it's as though they have moths in a closet full of beautiful things yes so yes. no matter how much they gather those things that were always going to eat all of that away there's no much no amount of of wealth or, or luxury mm -hmm. that they can wrap around themselves when inside they are actually impoverished especially yeah, exactly that. Yeah, 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 especially her. And, you know, um, the, the group I was with last night, it was all women. And, you know, they were all, we were, I mean, and I feel the same way. We were all like kind of giggling over Jackson because I, I did make him just that, that wonderful, wonderful guy. But he had his faults as well. He was pouring everything into his work. He loved his wife. He loved his kids, but he was pouring everything into his work. And, you know, as I was saying just a moment ago, Sometimes my characters say things that I don't expect them to say. And it was not planned that he was going to say to her, do you think my dad would be proud of me? And that was really the basis of why he worked as hard as he worked. It wasn't necessarily to make a nice home and uh, a, a good life for his wife and children, although naturally that is a part of it. But he was he was inside beating himself up, trying to please a man who had died when he was only 18, 19 years old. And I think a lot of men do that. Yes. So I think their fathers are dead or alive. I think they do that. So both men and women, husbands and wives come yeah. into a marriage with their own insecure baggage. Yeah. Yeah. So his insecurity was, am I proving myself as a man through my work? Right. And hers was, am I lovable? Am I beautiful? Yes. And, and am I mm -hmm. worthy of yeah. the grace and the forgiveness that God wants to give me. She was holding that off by not yeah. finding herself able to receive it. So yeah. that kind of impoverished her. And he was impoverished from receiving yeah. all the blessings he could have had because he was so driven to prove himself as well. Right. Yeah. I mean, he said to her when he told her he was going to drop out of college after his dad died, he said, I'm the only one who can save the business. Mm -hmm. Well, the thing is, is what if he had just said, shut the business down or sell the business or, you know, but he took that on because he loved his dad so much. He didn't want to see his dad's dream die. So he put his dream on hold and, and went for his dad's dream. And that's exactly what she had done. She had a dream of having an education. She didn't know what she wanted to do, but she knew she wanted to graduate from college and then that was interrupted by marriage. And, and so there is that, you know, this isn't necessarily the way I thought it was gonna turn out what I wanted to do, but I'm making the best of it I can. And, and I think that's so true for so many of us. We look back, we hit a certain age and we look back and we say, well, I coulda, <laughs> you know, I shoulda, I coulda done this, I shoulda done that. I, I do it myself, I think, why didn't I, why didn't I do this? Why didn't I, when I had the chance, why didn't, and you know, you can beat yourself up with that. Mm. And the, the fact is, is you didn't. And if you can do it now, do it. And if you can't, don't worry about it. And maybe that lines up with lead us not into temptation because sometimes good things become idols and mm -hmm. they get in the way of us experiencing blessings. Yes. And so for her, a good thing would have been college but it got in her way because she made that a higher priority than the grace of God. And yeah. a good thing was his work and honoring his father, but he yeah. put that as an idol in his life and chased yeah. it too hard. So when yeah. we put things in the wrong place, then we can have everything fall out of place. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. It, it's just, it, there's nothing wrong with working hard. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with being successful. There's nothing wrong with being a wife and a mother and when your kids get to be a certain age, then saying, okay, I'm going back to work and it's kind of what I was hoping to do one day, but it's not quite, but that's okay. You know, there's nothing wrong with any of that unless you turn that into some type of idol, some type of, or even um, uh, maybe almost a, 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 an idol of regret. True. You know, and his line was, we don't realize we're turning it into an idol until it gets there. Right. Yeah. Because, you know, she, when, when he tells her that he's going to quit school, she's like, oh, Jackson, no. He goes, I was studying business anyway. You know, so he's like, like he's just kind of cast it off, mm -hmm. you know, like, oh, well, you know, so, and then he just dove in full force. 
Mm -hmm. and, uh, and there was that moment, if you remember, where um, he thought he was going to lose it all and he couldn't figure out what was going wrong at work. And for him, it was not just a matter of, you know, I'm losing money at work. I don't know where it's going. You know, it's I'm losing my dad's business. Mm -hmm. I'm losing me. That's yeah. kind of where he was, too, yeah. because he's losing his father's business. He's losing yeah. himself. Because yeah. we can't put ourselves into something that isn't divine mm -hmm. and origin. Yeah, so. that's right. That's right. Yeah. It's a good lesson for all of us. And, uh, you know, and I think um, one of the things that we talked about, too, uh, last night was, you know, the, the, the whole thing of do you, do you purchase an ornament every year to commemorate the year? You know, I used to do that with the kids, you know, it's like, okay, this is your ornament for this year. And then when, you know, you hit a certain age, you took all those ornaments and handed them to them and that kind of thing. But even as I was putting up our tree and, and I put up four trees every year, but I was putting up one of the trees, it's called the family tree. And this is the tree where all the little ornaments that the children made or that somehow have something to do with the children that's where it goes. And then my, my memory ornament for my mom, my memory ornament for my dad, and even each one of our dogs, like I, I have a dachshund sleeping at my feet right now. And then I have the little doxy ornament and then we've had beagles and then we had a corgi. And so they all have their own little ornaments. But, you know, I, you put those up and you start thinking about, you know, the, the year she brought this home from school and gave mm -hmm. this to me and, and I'm so glad that I didn't just toss those in a box that I kept them, you know, the little popsicle reindeer and those kinds of things. I think that's a nice legacy that we can leave with ornaments. Mm -hmm. It is. Ornaments. And it's a wonderful yeah. theme of your book is keeping and treasuring the good memories mm -hmm. from our past mm -hmm. and making sure that we don't forget the blessings that we've been given along our journey. So absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So in conclusion, yep. what are some of the things that you hope for readers to receive as their gift from you, from the Ornament Keeper? Well, you know, for one, I do want them to just enjoy the story, mm -hmm. but I also want them to, to look deep inside themselves. Is there anyone that you're holding a grudge against? Is there something that you perceived as truth that may not be truth? Uh, and even if it is true, there is a way to work around it. You know, sometimes this stuff happens and we have to, we have to find the right spot for that stuff that happens. Mm -hmm. And just, you know, that if they could go into this holiday season with a new sense of joy and peace and forgiveness, because, you know, that is why Jesus came. We know that Jesus was not born on December the 25th or the 24th or however you want to look at it. We know that that's not when he was born, but this is when we choose to celebrate the fact that he did come. He was the one who came. And part of that was he, he came to bridge the gap between God and man, but also to, to offer that forgiveness that he talked about in the Lord's prayer. So, you know, this is a time to not only allow Christ to forgive us, us to forgive ourselves, but us to forgive others. And it may be that there's just some little something that you're holding on to. You may not even know what it is. You may not even know you're doing it, but asking God to reveal that to you, he will reveal it and, and make it right so that you can go into this season whole and complete, you know, because uh, at the end, of course, like I said, they are a whole and complete family again. That's what I hope. Thank you, Eva. I'm, I'm so grateful to you. And I hope that all of the readers that are watching this, all the viewers that are watching this, will also take advantage of this opportunity to receive the gift of a magnificent story, the okay. gift of deep truths wrapped in beautiful literature, that they will give themselves this wonderful gift of the ornament keeper. And they'll enjoy this Christmas season with a new perspective, including all the things that you just said so eloquently. And I thank you for joining us today. I'm thank so I feel blessed that you're here. And thank I pray so that you have a wonderful Christmas with your family. And thank you. We are planning on it. Yes, good. <laughs> well, thank you. And thank you again, Tina. And on that note, we will end and say happy Christmas. Yes, yes.